about that. Yeah. Uh, I studied geography with a focus on biogeography. Uh, and while I was in college, I was working as a carpenter, which I continue to do for a couple of years. And that kind of gave us a, a foundation of some of the like structural or material work that we do with houses and stuff like that. Um, just to check, I don't know, can, uh, Tiffany, can you see us? Is this all, you can see the slideshow and you can see yes. us. It all looks great. Good job. Perfect. All right. Well, I'll leave it probably to you, Ariel, to get started. Cool. So, all right. So we're, uh, we're going to talk about the differences between bees and wasps, solitary and social insect lives, um, local species, venom, stinging, removal and relocation and learn to live with uh, our stinging neighbors, which is what we actually do for work. Um, and then we'll kind of finish out with some anecdotal stuff and some questions and discussion. So that's gonna be the structure of the presentation. Uh, we are starting with a poll. And- Let's see where you all are at. Yeah. Did we launch that? Yeah, I think. Still learning to use Zoom. Uh, <laughs> there we there go. We Pulling. Go. All, right. All right. Cool. And for those of you who are on Facebook Live or can't see this, uh, the question is which of these local bees and wasps are you most afraid to encounter? Uh, honeybee, bumblebee, mason bee, paper wasp, bald faced hornet, or yellow jacket? I'll just give a few more seconds, then we'll see where everyone's at. Oh, we have one vote for Mason B. Yeah. So far. All right. I mean, is that <laughs> yeah, a few more coming in? That's 30 seconds for ending it. All right. So overwhelmingly, people are afraid of yellow jackets. After that, bald faced hornets. Uh, basically the order that we listed it in, which is great. So, um, <laughs> yeah. so no one's afraid of honeybees and no one's afraid of bumblebees. I think an interesting, you know, part, part of why we wanted to start with this question is just like, I think some of these scarier species are actually some of the coolest ones um, and, and are really exciting to get close to and see what's going on in the hive just because, uh, maybe, maybe because they're so terrifying, but um, what a lot of people don't think about too is that we get stung all the time by bumblebees and it's an it's it's awful. I don't know. They're uh sometimes species that uh don't seem as threatening can have a pretty nasty sting, depending on the species of bumblebee, really. Mason bees can't sting. All right. Next one. Oh. Uh, so what's the difference between bees and wasps? Uh, we encounter a lot of people who use uh, bee and wasp and hornet and yellow jacket relatively like interchangeable. Uh, it's not accurate. Uh, bees are pollinators, wasps are predators. Bees are fuzzy and less aggressive. Wasps are smoother looking and more aggressive. Um, Beehives are waxy, they produce comb, um, and wasp nests can also be concealed, but they also have kind of the dome-shaped stuff that you'll see in a tree or in the eaves of houses. Uh, in the state of Oregon, there's around 500 species of bees. That includes solitary bees, as well as the eusocial species like honeybees and uh, Bumblebees. Yeah. All right, we have another trivia question. The question is, which one of the following species is native to the Pacific Northwest? Honeybee, paper wasp, bald face hornet, or the murder hornet? A few more seconds. Oh yeah, 30. Couple more seconds. Good. 
All right. So honeybees, 19% of the vote. Uh, they're actually introduced from Europe. They're not native to this area. They're not native to North America at all. Uh, a lot um, of tribes as white people were coming west, they referred to honeybees as white man flies. Um, paper wasps are also introduced from Europe and Eurasia. Uh, Bald-faced hornet is uh, native to this area and the murder hornet is a species that's been getting a bunch of uh, media attention lately because it was introduced from Asia. Um, I guess one one little clarification, the paper wasps, uh, you know, there's actually a bunch of species of paper wasps. Felicity's diminula is the one that we see, uh, I mean in our work we see, it's probably 95 percent of the paper wasps we see. That one was introduced and it's really taken over but there are several species of native paper wasps as well. All right, solitary bees, uh, mason bees, you've probably bought those at like a garden store or something like that. Carpenter bees, cuckoo bees, leaf cutter bees, longhorn bees, sweat bees, mining bees. Uh, there's a lot of solitary species uh, in Oregon, all over the world, there's solitary species. Um, they have uh, a simple lifestyle. They lay eggs, then they hatch out, and the next spring there's a a flurry of these little solitary bees. Um, they're fun. They all have like interesting specializations. Um, there's leaf cutter bees are named because they'll take these little like half moon shapes out of leaves. Um, longhorn bees have these really long uh, antenna. Um, sweat bees are a little pollinator. They're bright green and really fast and mining bees live underground. Got a video of mining bees next. Here's some mining bee homes, and here's the video. Uh, this is like pretty standard mining bee behavior. There's a bunch of them. They're solitary bees, but they do nest colonially. Um, and they'll hover and hang out a couple inches above the ground. Uh, and that hole is where they live and store pollen, and then they eventually lay their eggs, and then a, another mining bee will hatch out next year. I think this is a video of one emerging. Okay, oh, no. Oops, next one. This is, here we go. This is a mining bee coming out of its tunnel. Solitary wasps. Mud dauber uh, is one that you've probably seen flying around. Uh, the most common solitary yeah. wasp we see. Definitely the most common. Uh, the picture on the right is it carrying a little pile of mud to make these homes, which are in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, you'll see those all over the place. They'll be up under eaves, sometimes on walls, uh, sometimes in, I don't know, we've seen them on trees all over the place. There's also wasp mimics are flies. Uh, they look like a wasp, but they're not. Uh, and then the Inchunamon wasp is also uh, a solitary wasp in this area, and they're pretty big. I think they're up to two inches long. Uh, and this is a video of a mud dauber making its home on some sheet metal in uh, central Oregon. So it's taking that ball of mud and just kind of packing it around uh, the dome in there, which is where it stores materials and lays eggs. It's a pretty nice looking mud dauber home. Yeah. Do we have any questions, uh, Tiffany? Yeah. yeah. Perfect. So I'm going to jump in here real quick. I'm also going to let folks know that if you are having the poll still on your screen and you're on Zoom, the way that you do that is in the corner, you control the poll. You can click the X in the right hand corner and that will close the poll. If you're viewing from Zoom, that may have popped up and some folks have asked how to close that out. So you do that yourself just by clicking the X on the right hand side. So yeah, just a small little webinar thing. Um, so great, I'm gonna go into Q&A. We've got a lot of great questions. So one of the first ones from Shannon, she said that she found a wasp nest in the corner of her ceiling over the porch. 
and she, it's about the size of a large lemon. She wants to know what's the best way to remove the wasp nest or get rid of wasps altogether. Uh, she doesn't, she can't leave them on the porch. Um, so yeah, that's a question from Shannon. Um, I feel like we're going to get into removal a lot more later. So if people have okay. kind of specific questions about what to do in this certain situation or not. Okay, uh, we'll save that one for later. We'll Should we save it for later? Okay. Yeah, I'll remember that one. So Shannon, you have not been forgotten. We'll come back to you. Um, so here's one that's maybe a little bit more relative. I think you answered this. Are bumblebees local to the Pacific Northwest? Yeah, so there, there are about a dozen species that are native to um, this particular, you know, Portland area. Um, but there are, uh, you know, tons of other species as well. I actually would really recommend, at the end of the presentation too, we reference a really wonderful guide that the Forest Service did mm -hmm. in, in a collaboration with the nonprofit Pollinator Partnership. Great. They have a guide to Western bumblebees and it's easy to find the PDF online. And we have a link at the end of the presentation too. Um, but that has just like wonderful illustrations of uh, the different bees, tips on IDing them, info on different, like slightly different life cycles and timing between the different species. So we have a lot of species here. Um, that being said, you know, most of our, most of our work uh, happens, of course, when people call us for a removal or something, or because they have questions about bees. There's um, one species that we see more than any other by a long shot. And um, I think that's partly because it's common here, partly because it's uh, one of the more defensive bumblebees. So we get a lot of calls, particularly about the black-tailed bumblebee, which is Bombus melanopygus. Right. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good answer. Very complete. Thank you for going into the details. Yeah, no. <laughs> so that was great. I loved it. I feel like I'm on a bee journey with you. Um, so here's a quick one. I think that you briefly, I don't know if you mentioned this already. Do mud daubers sting? They probably have the capability to, but stinging, and we'll talk about stinging and venom later, but really that's a defensive mechanism for when there's like a whole, like a hive structure or a colony to defend, which mud daubers don't have. Um, the stinger itself is like a, it's a modified ovipositor. Um, and uh, because, because the mud dauber is still a fertile female, uh, I, I don't think that they use their ovipositor as much. I guess I don't really know. Yeah. Yeah. We've never been stung by mud daubers. Good to know. Great. Um, do you have time for one more? What do you think? Sure, yeah. Cool. So this one, um, this is a great question. I'm very curious about this one. Meredith asked, in Portland, do we have wasps that will eat caterpillars? She says her garden has caterpillars and she wants to know. Um, yeah, I mean, wasps in general, um, they're predators like Ariel was saying. Uh, I mean, they, they technically, I actually saw someone mention in the chat earlier on that what a fun fact is that wasps actually pollinate. They do, they're kind of mediocre to poor pollinators. Really their focus is on <coughs> uh, predation. Um, and you know, most of their diet is kind of small soft bodied insects, including caterpillars. Obviously if you have a chicken at a picnic or something, they love that too. But um, so depending on the size of the caterpillar, I would say definitely. Um, I'm sure someone would be intimidated by a larger caterpillar, but. Good to know. Okay, great. Well, I'm gonna let you carry on. And then if people have other questions, feel free to put them in the Q and A as well. Cool. So why are some bees and wasps social and some solitary? Uh, the advantage to sociality is that uh, the colony is able to hoard more resources. There's a protective element to being, uh, to having a bunch of peers. Um, and there is also a genetic advantage, maybe not to a particular individual, but at least to the genetics of a, uh, the whole colony. Um, and it's important to remember that those colonies are uh, also kin groups. Um, it's generally a single queen uh, line, laying all those eggs. Um, so that's why some are social. Socialization also leads to specialization. And uh, these are images of honeybees. You have the queen who lays all the eggs. You have the drone who mates with the queen. Uh, there's multiple drones, not a singular drone. And then you have the uh, neutered 
uh, worker class, which does all of the work, the foraging, the uh, caretaking of all the eggs, um, the rearing of the young, and uh, the building of the comb and the protection of the colony. This is a video of a hunk of wasp comb. Um, these, this egg structure is a hallmark of eusociality. You have uh, eggs on the um, outside here near the thumb. You have the grubs after that. Then you have a uh, capped brood in there and then the ones in the center have hatched. Um, so you have this concentric lane uh, which uh, correlates to the amount of time that they've been in the comb. And here is a video of a honeybee worker emerging from a cell. Uh, this was from a removal we did just a few days ago. Um, and we just happened to pull this piece of comb out at the moment that this lady was crawling out of her hole. And that is the home where it came from. All right. So, um, so we're kind of, I'm going to talk a little bit about the life cycle of social bees and wasps. Most have basically a similar life cycle. There's sort of um, different seasonality with different species and um, slight variations, but for the most part, it's the same general idea with the exception of European honeybees. Um, so we'll talk, we'll talk more about that later, but so, you know, this, this general life cycle includes uh, bumblebees, hornets, wasps, um, all of those social uh, species around here. Um, so in general, in the springtime or early summer, um, the queen basically emerges from hibernation, essentially, and comes out and starts looking for a home, a place to build her nest. Um, and you know at that at that point she's all alone. Depending on the species, they look for a different you know each species sort of has a different nest niche that they're uh, looking to fill. Um, and the queen starts laying eggs, makes those first cells of comb, uh, and then you know pretty soon after that she raises a workforce around her and it reaches this rapid increase stage. When workers start doing the foraging, uh, the queen's now the nurse and the egg producer. And she is just laying, laying, laying. And those workers are making sure that there's enough comb for her to lay in. Um, and it just results in a really rapid buildup of that worker population. Um, the third stage, slow increase. Basically, after you know the colony, uh, say midsummer for most species, things are going. They're kind of they've reached maybe like a stasis in terms of the, the general growth of the colony. They're just accumulating resources and building up towards stage four, which is the climax of the colony. The worker population is no longer increasing. Um, the cells being built are all queen cells. Um, and basically what happens is uh, the, the colony is raising a ton of queens. Those queens mate with, uh, with those drones that we were talking about. Um, and then those queens go off and leave the hive. Um, and basically they find a spot to overwinter. To wait around. Oftentimes if they're looking for like a protected space, maybe it's under a shingle in a house or under bark on a tree or uh, in the ground, somewhere where they can hang out for the winter. Um, and then the colony itself, after producing all those queens, those mated queens, starts to enter its decline, um, which can be caused by the death or sickness of the existing queen, by cold weather. Um, basically, yeah, the colony cohesion breaks down. Some species will cannibalize each other, foraging becomes erratic, and eventually, you know, that the winter sets in and the colony just collapses. So almost all the social species we have around here have just an annual life cycle like this. And meanwhile, the queens um, during that overwintering period are just hibernating uh, in sheltered spaces before they emerge again to start a new colony the following year. Um, and I guess, so at this point, we're going to kind of go through a number of the specific social species that we see a lot of out here. Um, and funny that I should, I guess, have do that life cycle talk and then, you know, first thing have the one that doesn't fit the life cycle talk. So this is the European honeybee, um, beloved by beekeepers all around the world. Um, you know, they produce honey. Uh, 
we collect pollen from them. They're incredibly docile for a stinging insect. Um, and you know, humans have, uh, in many cases, found these really cool ways to interact with honeybees and different hives to put them in. And um, it's a lot of fun to keep bees. Uh, but, you know, like we were talking about earlier, they're not native, which is something a lot of people don't realize. Um, and additionally, they have a really unique life cycle in that they are perennial colonies, meaning that um, uh, basically, I mean, a honeybee colony can exist for years and years and years, and sometimes they'll requeen during that time. Sometimes a colony fails over the winter, but all of the, that workforce of thousands of worker bees is alive throughout the winter, and that's why they store honey. They need to have resources through the winter when flowers aren't uh, producing nectar. Um, so honeybees, they build wax comb in concealed spaces, um, and they fill it with resources, with honey and pollen to survive the winter. You know, the kind of, like the classic spot you'd see a honeybee would be like a, in the hollow of a, of a tree trunk or something. Um, but, uh, you know, here in Portland in the city, we actually get a lot of calls about honeybees moving into people's homes. They love, they love making hives uh, in sort of the space between studs in a wall or, or, or joists or uh, in attics. Um, they're basically looking for, when, when honeybees are looking to make a new hive, um, they raise, I guess, I'll, I'll go into the whole swarming thing really. Um, honeybee swarming is a really special part of, of the honeybee life cycle. In the spring, colonies that have overwintered successfully, they typically raise new queens um, and start building up their workforce in preparation for swarming. And when those queens hatch, if there's a new queen, it, it'll stay in the hive. And the old queen slims down, gets ready to fly again, and she'll leave with about half of the workforce in the hive. Um, and those bees go out and, you know, they'll oftentimes find like a tree branch or something or a fence post or even the ground, just a spot to hang out for a few days. They ball up into a, a kind of congealed mass of tens of thousands of bees. And then um, they start sending out scout bees looking for places to move into. And they're looking for places that have a, like a large cavity with a small defensible entrance. So that's why, you know, those tree hollows or, or uh, you know, cavities where there's a gap in a wall uh, are, are sort of ideal. Obviously, if you're a beekeeper, you can also catch those bees while they're in the swarm stage and put them in a hive box, which is by nature kind of a pretty ideal spot to live. So beekeepers love getting swarm calls. If you ever see a swarm of bees, um, you can always call us. You can contact, you know, here in Portland, there's the Portland Urban Beekeepers. Um, definitely some, some beekeeper will be very happy to put those in a hive. Swarming typically takes place between March and July, so we're kind of coming to the end of swarm season now. Um, swarms that happen later in the year, like later into the summer, it just is tough for them to have the time to get enough resources to overwinter that first year, so swarming drops off and swarms that do happen are a little less successful. Um, and yeah, there's both wild and managed colonies. And another uh, good thing to know is that, you know, honeybees, they have a barb stinger. Each insect can only sting once, um, which is probably related to the, why they're so docile. I mean, to uh, when a honeybee stings, it actually can kind of rip open the honeybee and it kills the bee that stung you. So um, they're pretty cautious with how they use that power. Here's a couple, here's a photo of a honeybee swarm on the left and a little video on the right of uh, kind of just activity on a, on a sunny day at a honeybee colony. Um, this level of activity, you know, dozens to hundreds of bees entering and exiting constantly uh, is pretty indicative of a honeybee colony around here. We don't really see that level of activity from any other species. So when you catch a honeybee swarm, um, you, if a beekeeper catches a honeybee swarm, you can add it to your own boxes. This is one that Ariel and I caught last spring, about a year ago. Um, and what we did is we basically just, we, we captured the swarm when it was just a ball of bees in a tree, um, dumped it out on a, on a ramp in front of our hive, 
and those bees, you know, they, they recognize that it's an ideal spot to move into. And so they just move in on their own. This is a time lapse of that process. Bumblebees, um, like we were saying, there's a number of bumblebee species. Um, they're the other social bee that we see a lot of around here. Um, they're relatively large fuzzy bees, typically like quarter sized maybe, whereas honeybees are maybe close to the size of a dime. Um, they have dark black, bright yellow, and orange markings. Um, excuse me. And there's about a dozen species in the Pacific Northwest, 250 species worldwide, um, 40 in North America. They build waxy comb as well, um, also in a concealed location, but pretty different. It's really different comb from a honeybee. I mean, if you, uh, you can see this is kind of more of a bulbous looking comb. It's not in any sort of routine hexagonal pattern like honeybee comb. Um, and the colonies are much smaller, you know, just up to a few hundred individuals. Um, and they're annual colonies, so they don't overwinter. So, you know, you can see actually here that there's some nectar stored, but they don't, they don't uh, create honey. And, you know, it's, it's that same life cycle where the queens hibernate over the winter and then they build up a nest during the warm season and then the colony collapses. So we see bumblebees in all kinds of, we see tons of bumblebees in birdhouses. We see bumblebees, uh, they love insulation in, in, you know, houses or sheds. They love attics. They, uh, they nest in all kinds of weird spots. Um, this is probably the weirdest one we've seen. We've got a call about this bumblebee nest in someone's, uh, in their teenage daughter's bean bag out on the porch, uh, which it was pretty wild to see. It's <laughs> <laughs> All right. Paper wasps. So Polistes dominula is the one that we were, the species we were talking about in the trivia there. That's the introduced species that makes up a lot of our uh, paper wasps around here these days. Um, but there are other paper wasp species as well. Um, basically they're black and yellow wasps with an elongated body and long dangling legs. And they, it, they're pretty distinct. Um, they really have these long legs and they sort of move around aimlessly often like around the eaves of houses and uh sheds they, they love they have these sort of hanging nests uh and they they have really specific um they're they're interested in basically specific features habitat features to build those nests off of um they're unique in that uh, there's, there's really hardly any differentiation between the queen. It's actually in paper wash, they call it a foundress because of this and the workers. The workers are fertile. Um, if, so if the queen uh, dies or you know, moves on to a different colony or who knows what, those workers can start laying, like a worker could sort of transition into the queen role. Um, and as far as we know, they're sort of just uh, evolutionarily, they haven't progressed as far into the specialization of social insects as some of the other bugs that we're talking about. So, you know, evolutionarily, more recently, they were in a position where they were solitary, and then they they're sort of in that transition space where they're not uh, they're not solitary. Um, but oops, uh oh, I left our paper wasp slide. Uh, where they're not solitary anymore, but they, they still haven't fully specialized. Um, and really, there are least aggressive wasp species. I don't think I've ever been slung by paper wasps in the area. Yeah, yeah. Um, we get calls about them all the time, and uh, they, they're, they're pretty remarkably non-aggressive. Uh, so there's two species in the dog. Olocovescular genus that we're going to talk about. One is aerial yellow jackets, and we don't see many of these in Portland, but we have friends up in Olympia and uh, Southwest Washington that get these all the time. Um, they're one of two species in this genus that has this really characteristic uh, papery concealed comb. So they, they can, there's hexagonal comb inside there, and they conceal it with that papery shroud. Um, they're also annual colonies, um, and you know, that nest. This nest was probably about the size of a small 
soccer ball, I guess, but um, they get up to the size of a, uh, a watermelon. Um, and the nests are commonly found hanging from root eaves, branches, shrubs. Uh, they're less aggressive than most yellow jackets, but they definitely will defend their nest. Um, probably our least aggressive yellow jacket species that we have, but uh, I wouldn't want to cross them. In that same genus, we have bald-faced hornets. Um, this is one of the ones that uh, I think a lot of people were afraid of in that poll in the beginning for good reason. Um, we actually don't get stung much by bald-faced hornets. Um, they, I mean, simply because we wear really uh, heavy-duty bee suits. Um, and they, for whatever reason, they don't, you know, some of the yellow jackets will really try and crawl into little holes in the suit, any kind of vulnerability in our suit. For whatever reason, bald-faced hornets don't do that kind of burrowing thing. But if they do sting you, if you don't have a suit on, it hurts a lot. Um, and even with a the suit, they actually spray venom. So we have to wear glasses or safety glasses when we work with bald-faced hornets because they'll, I mean, they'll come right up to your face and they're like spraying you in the eyes. It can be, uh, it can be a little intense. Um, so they have that, this is a view just of the inside of one of those nests of some of that capped brood that we were talking about. But this, in the wild, this would be surrounded with that papery comb. It looks almost identical to the aerial yellow jacket comb. Um, and I think I got pretty much everything in the notes there. Um, let's see. So we have a couple of species also of cavity nesting yellow jackets. And, you know, I say cavity nesting just because that's uh, sort of the, the life history piece that unifies these two species, the common yellow jacket and the Western yellow jacket. Um, they, like honeybees or bumblebees, you know, they're looking for a cavity with a small defensible entrance. The difference is that these guys, uh, ladies, I should say, can, uh, they can actually dig out cavities. So sometimes a ground nest, you know, they've, they've dug out the cavity themselves. Whereas like bumblebees, for example, don't do that cutting and digging. They, they opportunistically find spaces to move into. Um, but still, you know, these uh, common yellow jackets and Western yellow jackets will move into house walls, they'll move into birdhouses. They have ground nests. Um, I don't know, any other, what other unique spots have we seen them in? Ground houses. Um, kind of, all, I mean, all kinds of different machinery, things. Yeah, machinery, <laughs> cars. We've seen them like in the old cars that haven't been used for a while. Um, and they can be very aggressive. Um, yeah, oh, hollow logs, that's even on the side. Mm -hmm. So we, we often call these uh, Vespula vulgaris. Technically, they were split um, from, uh, they, they formerly, Vespula vulgaris was uh, species across all, um, uh, I think, like temperate uh, North America, Europe, and Asia. Um, and now they've been split into Vespula alicensis. Um, the Western yellow jacket is the other cavity nesting yellow jacket that we have around here. Um, they're also black and yellow wasps with annual colonies. Um, they also look for cavities to build their nests in. They're also pretty aggressive. And really, there's not a whole lot. It's pretty difficult to distinguish uh, from the Alicensis species except that there's this eye ring that, so the Western yellow jacket, the Pennsylvanica species has this complete eye ring behind the eye. Whereas here on the right, the vulgaris or uh, alicensis doesn't. So um, pretty tough to tell the difference unless you have a really close look at the two. And in terms of their habits and nests, they're almost identical. Um, one cool thing, that we have done is that, so, so when we collect bugs, we actually, um, with, with honeybees or bumblebees, we make sure to relocate them. We want to keep them alive. We want to keep them pollinating, doing their thing. Um, wasps and yellow jackets, we basically, uh, you know, they're not, they're not threatened species. They actually haven't suffered some of the same um, population losses that a lot of bees have. Um, and their venom is valuable for people who have um, 
basically anaphylactic allergies, you can get um, allergy immunotherapy treatments using bee or wasp venom. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but we actually uh, went to Hawaii this last fall to collect um, Pennsylvanica, um, the, the Western yellow jacket, because it was introduced there. And I think it's kind of interesting just to see. So Vesculo Pennsylvanica, the Western yellow jacket was introduced to the Hawaiian Islands on shipments of Christmas trees. Basically those uh, hibernating queens were under the bark or in the boughs of the tree. Um, and they've just taken off over the last about 30 years. And because it's a tropical climate there, they actually have perennialized. So I'll show this video. This is just the comb from one nest of Pennsylvanica on the big island of Hawaii. And then here you can also kind of see some of that, uh, basically different stages of larvae in there, capped brood and uncapped brood. Here's a really active nest. This is a perennial nest. This is way more activity than we would ever see here in the Northwest. Um, but you know, the story of Vespula Pennsylvanica on the Hawaiian Islands is really just, um, I mean, it's yet another story of how invasive species can enter, it can be introduced to a, an environment that's pretty different from their own and really take over. So I'll show a couple more videos of this. So I've got a, this is kind of a slow motion video here. These tubes here are actually, it's the mouth of a vacuum. So we are using a vacuum to collect the bugs and then freeze them so that the venom can be used for allergy immunotherapy. Um, and you can see them kind of, this is slow motion here. You can see them getting sucked into that vacuum. Here's, here's kind of the, this is a different nest on the right, but here's what it looks like in real time. It, it's really just when you bang on the ground there, it's just explosive activity um, where the yellow jackets come out to defend their hive. Uh, definitely got a lot of stings in Hawaii. They, there's just so many bugs. It was pretty unbelievable. Um, so there's some uncommon uh, wasp species we have around here as well. Uh, black jackets, parasitic yellow jackets, forest yellow jackets, and prairie yellow jackets. We don't see these species a whole lot. Um, but you know, just, just to illustrate that there is some, some diversity in terms of social species here that we're not going into. Um, and I had to, I, we had to add a slide on the Asian giant hornet too, the murder hornet that people are talking about, um, because, you know, it's just been introduced. I saw we had someone from Bellingham. You're, you're right in the hot spot there. Um, it's been introduced to Northwest Washington. There were a couple colonies or a couple, excuse me, I think a couple uh, colonies or individuals, I, I'm actually forgetting, that were identified in, at the end of 2019, and there's been a couple more sightings this spring. Um, and the Washington State Department of Agriculture has implemented a hornet watch and trapping program to prevent the spread of this species. I don't think we'd have the same sort of situation that they have in the Hawaiian Islands with Vespula pennsylvanica, um, just because our climate, I don't, you know, our climate here is relatively similar to the temperate climates that the Asian giant hornet exists in across the Pacific. Um, but still, you know, we, we haven't had any in Oregon, but we're definitely uh, hopeful that those eradication efforts work soon because um, they really could change the sort of uh, insect web of life around here if they were, not to mention that they uh, probably really hurt to get stung, but we'd have to get some new bee suits, I bet. <laughs> yeah, actually, Thanks, Ariel. We should take a quick question break. Tiffany, I don't know if uh, there's any, any ones that stand out to you that you want to bring up? Oh, yeah. it's Everyone's really excited about that vacuum. I just want to throw that out there. Oh, yeah. I, I should explain more about it. Yeah. That was so. crazy. I feel like I just want to throw out some vacuum-related questions because that was, yeah. <laughs> I was like sitting here. It was emotional. So here's what we've got. Someone just asked, I remember this one, how do you know you vacuumed them all? This is from, um, let me see who asked this. Never mind. We'll just continue. How do you know you vacuum them all? I can't remember who asked at this point. Yeah. So basically, when we set up, when we go to a nest, 
Um, and we'll, again, I think we'll talk a little bit more about our removal technique later in the presentation, um, although we can always answer more questions. When we go to a nest, you know, it's the middle of the day, there's who knows how many foragers just out in the world collecting uh, small insects or food or what have you, or pollen if it's a bee. Um, and the first thing we do is we set up a vacuum typically. So that as those foragers come back to the hive, they get collected. And then as foragers leave to go out collecting whatever they're collecting food, basically, they get sucked into the vacuum as well. And you can see how we sort of position that nozzle right there. So it's, you know, we, we're often kind of troubleshooting how to, how to get the nozzle to stay right where we want it to so that it is in that flight path and collects all those workers. Um, and then we, it, the, the exact techniques depends a little depending on the species, but then we manually remove the nest and the comb. So if it's a ground nest of yellow jackets, we physically dig up the nest and remove it. Um, that again differs species to species, but basically after we've removed the, the comb and the vacuum's just running, we just wait until we stop seeing any return from foraging and then we're ready to go. That's great. Sounds like you could, like catch them all. Um, yeah. Perfect. So I have another question. Um, Ooh, I think you kind of talked about this one. I'm going to go to another one. Um, someone wanted to just mention Kevin said he really, really wants live footage inside of a beehive. Kevin from Facebook just commented that. So we'll see if we can get that to you later, Kevin. If not, I may pass that along, see what connections we have there. You got a lot of really quick, great footage. Okay, another question. Um, someone just asked, can common yellow jackets chew through house sightings? Like um, house. Probably depends on the siding material. We've seen them chew through drywall a lot. Um, so they, you know, oftentimes they'll exploit an existing vulnerability in someone's house siding where maybe there's a hole between two beveled boards or something and they'll get into the space between the, the, um, the studs in the wall. And then they'll start to gnaw through the drywall and can make it through into the house itself. Um, I don't know, potentially some sightings they could gnaw through from the outside, but um, not drywall. asbestos, not plaster, not stucco. Uh, maybe wood. Not aluminum. Yeah, maybe like old wood, but for the most part, they're looking for something that's easy to get into. Great. Like, so. um, someone was asking about all the different types, so you just covered that perfectly. Thank you. People are like, oh, how are they going to get in? Okay, so someone has a question. Amy, I put this in the chat. Um, she was wondering how are pollinator species uh, bees doing in the Pacific Northwest? I don't know if you want to cover this later. She came here from Colorado where bee death was considered a crisis that needed immediate attention and was just checking in on how they're doing in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, we can, we can, we'll talk more about, um, we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end and sort of some of the like consequences of pesticides and related stuff to that. Okay, that sounds great. All right, let me see if there's anything else you want to cover this. Let's see. Um, interesting. This is kind of like a fun one from Jessica. She said she's heard that bumblebees are the only bees that can shake out and pollinate zucchini and squash. Is it true? Um, I don't know specifically about zucchini and squash, but I've heard that about tomatoes and I would, I definitely believe it. Basically bumblebees have this really cool mechanism. People call it buzz pollination where they, um, you know, they go up to a flower and you can hear them if you're watching them, they do kind of a low bzzz as they uh, vibrate, I guess probably their wings. Um, and that like helps extract the pollen or, or gets the pollen to stick to them. Um, and there are, you know, I'm, I'm sure that maybe some other bee could get a little pollen off of there, but there's something about that strategy that really works to get pollen from some plants. So um, there are some, uh, you know, some food crops where people specifically import bumblebee hives um, and, you know, say put them in a greenhouse or something to make sure that you get good pollination. But I think that's just kind of a cool thing to think about in general. Like a lot of these bees sort of co-evolved with different plant species and different flower species and have um, specific food sources that work well for them. 
Oh, I learned a new fact. Okay, so let's see. What do you think? One more. Let's. We've got. Okay, we're actually running out of time, so I'm gonna have you keep on rolling. We'll we'll take a. Okay. Break. Okay. Sounds good. Um. Here, so everyone's had a minute probably to look at this already. This is just a month by month bug guide that Ariel and I drew up um, for the Portland area. Um, pretty similar, you know, in our in our general uh, Pacific Northwest region across the region. Um, but you can see that, you know, honeybees, they have those perennial colonies. So they, you can see honeybees in active colony any, any time in the year. Um, bumblebees, you know, across all the species, this is sort of the range you would see. Some species may only be out March through June or July. Other species are more like June through October. Um, and then here's some of the other, other species we were just talking about. So a couple of questions, why do bees and wasps sting and what is venom? And Ariel kind of talked about this a little earlier, but you know, stinging is a defense mechanism um, that some solitary species possess, but you know, really that, that ability was honed through socialization too, because these colonies started to store a bunch of resources. All of a sudden they have just, you know, they have a queen to defend. They have tons of workers in the same spot. Um, and that, that sort of accumulation of resources in one location meant that the sting became really advantageous for, you know, for defending the hive um, from anything that would want to steal resources or eat the bugs. Um, and so stings, you know, when bees are wasps sting, they inject venom into you. Um, and venom is basically just a, a combination of, of different proteins that can, I mean, depending on the species, it can do all kinds of, it can obviously cause pain, affects your nervous system, can cause cell death. Um, and Ariel was actually just researching, what was it about the wasp venom that it prevents blood flow too? Yeah. That um, basically- it, To increase the duration of the pain. <laughs> yeah, right. So, you know, blood washing, sort of washing that venom away and diluting it is uh, one way the body can um, and, and the pain you're feeling and, and wasp venom has some, some chemicals that reduce blood flow so that it hurts for longer. Um, so with obviously stinging, uh, you know, most people, it hurts, it's not fun, it's surprising, it's scary. Um, a normal local reaction, you might have a little bit of swelling, um, and you feel that pain, but some people have a much more significant, much more severe reaction. A large local reaction can involve swelling or hives, um, you know, across like a much larger uh, portion of your body. And then anaphylaxis can happen, um, which is like a, a more serious allergy that can result in, you know, that's the one we hear about where people are carrying around an EpiPen, it can result in, um, I mean, the most concerning thing is if you lose the ability to breathe because of sort of, uh, the swelling that's going on. Um, about 3% of adults are allergic at the anaphylactic level. Um, so what to do about it, it's important to know your bugs. Different venoms have different compositions. And so you may have been stung in the past by a honeybee and didn't have a reaction, but you would have a reaction to a common yellow jacket, something like that. And vice versa, you know, you may think, oh, I'm allergic to bees, but there may be a specific species you're allergic to and others that you're not allergic to. And um, a physician can do tests to figure out what species you're allergic to exactly. And then go from there if you want to pursue immunotherapy or if you want to have an EpiPen and Benadryl. Um, if you're allergic or if you're just around bees a lot, it's definitely worth uh, at least carrying Benadryl um, and you know, consider carrying an EpiPen as well. Um, I, I put this note in about AubbyQ here. It's just a newer brand that's actually a lot less expensive. So they've made it a lot more affordable to have that security. We have another trivia question. Let me pull this up. Pulling. Oh, I see. We didn't stop sharing that last one. All right. Just launched the poll. So what's your experience getting stung by bees or wasps? I've been stung and I've had an anaphylactic reaction. I've been stung but didn't have an anaphylactic reaction or I've never been stung by a bee or wasp. Yeah, see about that 3% rule. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we'll give another, another 
10 or 15 seconds here. All right, ending the poll. Wow, that's uh, spot on. Three percent. I'll show the results here. Three percent had an anaphylactic reaction. I had no idea our presentation was that accurate. <laughs> so, um, and then, of course, you know, lots of us have been stung. Um, it hurts, but generally, it's not the end of the world. And wow, six percent of people here haven't been stung at all. Um, you know, it's kind of a wild experience. It might happen to you. You never know. Um, so let me close that out. So in terms of whether or not you should think about removing a hive, um, I mean, there's really a lot, there's a lot of considerations. And I feel like, you know, we, you know, of course we run a business, we make money doing removals, but we honestly wind up talking a lot of people out of removing bees. You know, part of why we're here is because we want people to learn about bees and wasps and to understand sort of the ecological benefits that they have. Um, and, uh, you know, ideally to be a little less panicked about it. I think a lot of people call us thinking it's a total emergency. Oftentimes, maybe someone just has bumblebees and, you know, we can tell them they have a beneficial native pollinator in their yard that they can uh, hopefully learn to live next to. And of course, we relocate bumblebees all the time as well if folks have um, if they're concerned about allergies or kids or pets, or if it's not in an appropriate area. So this slide is just kind of about to help people make that call whether or not they'd want to remove a hive um, or relocate a hive. Um, first thing to think about is how aggressive is the species? Also, where's the nest located? And then do children and families use the area? Um, that in part just because, you know, kids are always running around exploring stuff and um, have uh, a knack for getting into yellow jacket nests, really. Um, some of these most aggressive species are the common yellow jacket, the western yellow jacket, bald-faced hornet, and the aerial yellow jacket. Um, these species, more often than not, people just want to get rid of them. They also are all species that are, you know, not uh, ecologically threatened. Um, so, you know, I don't, personally, as a biologist, don't have really many qualms about removing these species um, as long as pesticides aren't used. Um, less aggressive, we typically don't recommend removal except in certain situations would be honeybees unless the hive is in a structure. If you have honeybees in the wall of your house, you definitely want to get rid of them. Um, bumblebees and paper wasps. And then non-aggressive species are those solitary species. We get calls all the time in the spring about mining bees in particular, Ariel showed those videos, and you can see sometimes there's just thousands of bees or hundreds of bees and it looks intimidating, but they're not gonna sting you. They're awesome native pollinators. And really, uh, like Ariel was saying, you know, they, they don't have a single colony. Um, so they emerge from tons of different little holes all around a field or a lawn basically. And so there's not really an effective method to remove them without pesticides. And for that reason, Oops. Uh oh. For that reason, we don't recommend removing them. Same with mud daubers; they're just they're just not a threat to to our safety at all. Um, I just I think I just saw a lot of questions come in. Do you, are there some you want to bring up, Tiffany? Uh, no worries. Yeah, we can check in a few questions right now. Someone had a bunch of questions about allergies. Uh, one of them was, "Is it true that you can build up an allergy?" <laughs> That you can build up an allergy? Yes, like over time. Yeah, you know, I'm, uh, I have, I've talked with friends about this too, and I feel like it's um, more likely when people aren't, like, aren't allergic to bees, and then they have an allergic reaction, I think more likely than not, they're getting stung by a new species and they have a reaction to a species they haven't been stung by yet, something like that. Um, I think typically getting stung more often results in like a diminished allergic response. So if you're stung a lot by the same species, more likely than not, you're gonna have a diminished response. 
I'm also not a allergy expert, to be honest. So that's <laughs> maybe um, I should do a little more research into that. But that's kind of been the consensus around that with some of the other bee folks that I've talked with. Um, and that's sort of one of the principles behind allergy immunotherapy is that, you know, if you are introduced time and time again to the same venom, and uh, like starting with a tiny dose and just ever increasing just a little bit, you can build up a tolerance to the point where you don't need to be afraid that you're going to have an anaphylactic reaction. That's great. Yeah, that's definitely reversed to what someone's question was, could it, could stings increase your susceptibility to anaphylaxis? So that's great to hear that. Um, I don't know how you're doing on time if you have more things you want to go through, um, but I'm going to have you save like maybe the last questions till the end. Oh, that sounds good. We're close to the end, so. Okay, great. So I'll save yeah, that till the end. Sadly, we more. won't be able to get through everyone's, but we'll see if we can get there. I want you to get through your content first, though. Yeah, sounds good. Um, so removal options, um, basically there's, there's several different ways people can remove or relocate bees. Um, you can do it on your own. Um, you know, oftentimes if there's say like a paper wasp nest that's like just started on someone's eve or something, honestly, you could blast it down with the hose and that queen still has the opportunity if it's early in the season to go make another hive somewhere else, hopefully where they're not going to be bothering you. Um, a conventional exterminator typically sprays uh, like a powder liquid insecticide um, and we'll talk a little bit more about pesticides in a second or you know what we do is we use pesticide free methods um, meaning that we, we suit up and we uh, manually remove the entire colony and use that for most species use that vacuum trap to collect the workers um, but I did want to talk more about prevention because I think that's one of the most important pieces is that, you know, no one wants to have bees or wasps in the wall of your house. No one wants to have it like in a birdhouse right in the backyard, um, right on your deck or something. So thinking about, I mean, it's really one of those situations where like a ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. You know, if you take the time to, to make sure your vents are screened in your home, to make sure that you don't have holes in your siding um, between boards or, you know, uh, in the blocking that goes into your attic, something like that. Just looking for spaces that a bee could fit into and get access to the um, to the inside of your wall. Um, looking for those spaces and then sealing them is relatively easy work that, uh, you know, saves, um, I mean, it's both good for bees because they'll hopefully pick a better location to make a nest in. Um, and then also, uh, it's a lot easier to seal up some cracks before bees get in there than it is to deal with them afterwards. Um, and then another thing, birdhouses. I couldn't even tell you how many calls we got about birdhouses this spring <clears throat> where there's bees, bumblebees in a birdhouse, or later in the summer we have yellow jackets in a birdhouse. Um, and with bumblebees especially, you know, I, I often suggest for people to just leave bumblebees in their yard. They're so awesome to have, but a lot of people don't want them um, you know, maybe like right next to their back door or something. So if you have birdhouses or other sort of habitat features, those cavity spaces with a small entrance, if you can move them somewhere where if they get occupied by bumblebees, you'll happily have neighbors and you won't need to remove them. Um, so those are, those are a couple tips, you know, there's also just a certain amount of uh, luck in in where insects choose to make a home. You know, you may have a house that has plenty of holes in the walls and you won't get bees for years. And, uh, you know, then again, maybe one year you do, it's just sort of, or, or, you know, you do everything you can to move different habitat features. And then there's a ground nest of yellow jackets just right in the middle of everything. So there's a certain amount of luck, but there's also a lot that we can do to think ahead and try to, try to structure our homes and our, our lives in ways that, um, let us live a little more, uh, I guess, harmoniously with stinging insects, you know. Um, here's a few videos, just, just kind of on the topic of removal. So the left one is a honeybee hive that we're, I'm just going to play this one again. The honeybee hive um, in someone's soffit space in their house that we're removing. Center one here, you can see yellow jackets uh, this is in Selwood in Southeast Portland getting sucked into the, this is a ground nest of yellow jackets getting sucked into the vacuum trap. And then here you can see, you know, we've basically just made these sort of custom 
uh, collection jars um, that we collect the wasps in uh, and then freeze them. So I wanted to talk a little bit too about consequences of pesticides. Um, I know we're I know we're low or out of out of time maybe, but I it's just I think so important to uh, think about the ways that different things that we do can sort of cascade through the ecosystem. Um, and pesticides are one of those things, you know, where you may, uh, you know, it may be an easy way to deal with the yellow jacket nest. Um, some, although I will say a, a lot of times we get calls where it didn't work. Um, but, you know, those pesticides can be transferred to other bugs, to butterflies, to, you know, to bodies of water, to birds, um, and, and can really contaminate a larger area and oftentimes have some pretty serious toxicity to humans as well. Um, one situation that we get a lot, which is just super sad, is that we, we often get calls when honeybee swarms move into, so honeybees, I guess when they're swarming, they're really attracted to spaces that honeybees have been in before. And we get calls all the time where bees, honeybees have moved into a location um, where a beehive had been before and someone had poisoned it. And so when we open it up to relocate the bees, the bees are just kind of twitching around and, and don't look healthy and it's a, you know, and the, and the colony is dying already essentially because some of those residual pesticides will remain in the wax or in powder form around the entrance to the hive. Here's a couple videos just from a couple of those removals this spring. I don't know if it's easy to see, but these are honeybees that have been exposed to pesticides and they're just kind of twitching around. They're on their back. They're unable to move. These bees on the right by the window here. Um, I mean, any normal bee would be sort of flying. Oh, there's Ariel removing it. <laughs> any normal bee would be flying right at that window and these ones can't even make it off the ledge. So you can really just uh, see some of the ways that they're, they're impacted there. Um, yeah, another thing, you know, pesticides, they often don't solve the problem long term. A lot of it has to do with pest proofing and some of those preventative measures. Um, and then ultimately there are pesticide free alternatives, um, which, you know, to me seems like kind of a no brainer if you can take care of something without potentially toxic or harmful chemicals. Um, it's a good option. So we wanted to point out a few resources that we really appreciate. Um, there's this book, the top one here, Pacific Northwest Insects by Merrill Peterson. Um, he's actually a professor up in Bellingham, I think. Um, and it's an amazing book. It came out in 2018. And I think that if you're interested in, you know, in some of these bugs or just in kind of insects in general in the Northwest, it's a really fun guide to have where I feel like when I got this book, it just like opened up this whole world where you start to look around and you're like, oh my gosh, that's a sweat bee or oh wow, that's like, you know, that's whatever mud dauber. And you can, it's a, it's a fun book for, um, for anyone who wants to get more excited about just looking into the bugs that you see in your yard or around the park or wherever. Um, the Xerxes Society is an amazing nonprofit that does um, native invertebrate protection work and, and uh, they're based here in Portland. Um, they've got tons of cool programs going on. They, um, yeah, I mean, they're all, they're all about native invertebrates, including pollinators um, and including some of the species we talked about. Notably, you know, they don't really work with honeybees or anything because honeybees aren't native. Um, Bugguide.net actually has a lot of great info. If you're looking, if you, uh, you know, have a photo of a bug and you're trying to ID it, um, Bumblebees of the Western United States is that guy that we were talking about earlier. Um, here's the link for it. Um, and it's, but you also, if you search just like USF, USFS uh, bumblebees of the Western United States, I think you would find the PDF pretty easily, but it's really an amazing resource for getting into bumblebees. Um, and then we have a bunch of info on our website here and you're always welcome to call us. There's our number, 503-451-0595. Um, we, uh, I mean, really like we got into this uh, in part because we do bee removal and also just because we love teaching people about insects and learning from other people too and uh, just interacting with the insect world. So we're always happy to just chat, answer questions. Um, 
you know, anything. So I think that's all. There's our contact info and our, this is our handle on Instagram too. We, we generally post a lot of cool facts and stuff on there, but happy to answer more questions. Great. Right. Yeah. There's a lot more questions. If you let's maybe spend a few more minutes. I don't want to take too much of y'all's time, but one of a lot of people are saying thank you right now and that you're compassionate and kind be advocates and it's been super informative. So just want to let y'all know, uh, folks really appreciate you coming on. And also as a Johnson Creek watershed council, just want to say a big thanks for coming on and sharing a lot of your wealth of knowledge information. Um, we will also be having another one of these just so for folks to know as they're leaving. Uh, next month in August, we have an organization called Ground Score, which helps provide um, on-site uh, on information for when you're going through and restoring Riverside areas for what items that you're finding are items from houseless folks and what items you clean up. And they bring into light human advocacy in part of, of river restoration. So kind of bridging two worlds. We're having another great organization coming on. Um, and you'll be able to read more about that. I'm going to send out an, an email tomorrow with the recording and things like that. So just a little PSA before we get into the question. So yeah, now if you're still here, we're going to answer like one or two more questions before we finish this up. One of them that someone asked a few different times, maybe this will just be our last question to finish, is if you put like a fake decoy a wasp or leave a wasp nest up, do you think that deters bees or wasps at all? Someone asked this a few different times in different ways. Yeah, we've heard of that before. I think that it uh, it like triggers some sort of territorial response, but I can't remember what it does. Yeah, I don't know the specifics about that, but I've I've heard sort of anecdotally about that as well. I don't like it. We'd have to research it. It's preventative. I don't think it's curative. I don't think you could get rid of a wasp nest by putting a paper bag next to it. But potentially preventative if uh, someone's got an issue. That's I think so, okay. that was asked a lot. Okay, great. Yeah, I think that for now, um, a lot of folks have left. So I think we'll finish up on the questions. But yeah, just a big thank you for you two once again, Roby and Ariel, co founders of Portland Natural Bee Removal. If you have more questions or you have bees or wasps or hives on your property and you're wondering how am I going to get rid of them or what does a consult look like? Um, tomorrow, I'm going to be sending out an email to all the panelists. I'll also write a comment and put it on the Facebook live stream that just shares for folks um, how you can get in contact with Roby and Ariel from Portland Natural Bee Removal and other ways and kind of resources of information that you shared too for that resource page. Uh, Roby, I'll get that from you and include it in the email for folks who are wondering where are the resources? How do I contact these two amazing, compassionate uh, beekeepers? Do you consider yourself beekeepers? Yeah, we're, we, we have a few hives at our house, oh, yeah. but, you know, we're beekeepers just for fun as a hobby and, and, and you know, honeybees are a Side, lot of fun. Uh, I'm hobby fun. beekeepers. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah, thank you so much for coming on. Um, and yeah, stay tuned for more events from Johnson Creek coming up uh, next month. We'll keep posting on Facebook and Instagram and on our website. I know a lot of folks, we didn't get to a lot of people's questions. We're sorry about that. We had a lot of interest. Um, feel free, like I mentioned, I will send out their email address if you're looking for questions about your property. Uh, they work locally in the Portland metro area. How far do you guys go out, by the way? Um, we, I mean, we've done some further jobs, but typically within about 50 miles of Portland. Right, so if you're in 50 miles of Portland, you're in luck. So yeah, there's, there's still time to ask questions, hopefully later uh, via email. So thank you guys so much for joining. I hope you have a great rest of your day. And thanks once again, Robbie and Ariel, co-founders of Portland Natural Bee Removal. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thank thanks, you. bye.